The President's Press Conference from the State Department Auditorium in Washington, D.C., April 3rd, 1963. Afternoon. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. President, when a government department feels it necessary to check on a news story that's displeasing to that department, how do you feel about using lie detectors on men you've appointed to office? Well, are you talking about a hypothetical case or an actual case? I'm talking about a case that started at the Pentagon but was called off today. No, well, I think that the uh, case... Uh, Secretary McNamara was asked to investigate how uh, this Air Force document was uh, put out to the press. At, and at the suggestion of the committee, investigation uh, was begun. I think that uh, it was a mistake to suggest a polygraph. And uh, I think Secretary McNamara, when he learned that uh, in the investigation that uh, a document uh, was suggested which would indicate that the witness might be willing to accept uh, a polygraph. I think that he decided that uh, that was an error and uh, he and, and Secretary Zuck had changed it. So I don't think uh, we need concern ourselves in the future about it. The fact of the matter, no polygraph was given. Do you intend to support SEC staff recommendations for legislation designed to curb certain abuses in the securities industry? Well, I'll, have to see the I'll have to see the recommendations when they come to the White House and then We'll have a chance to look at it, and then I can give you a better answer after we've examined it. Mr. President, two weeks ago you said you wanted to wait until the end of March before taking uh, another look and saying something about the Soviet troops in Cuba. Do you have any new information for us on how many have been pulled out and what can be done to get the rest of them out? Well, we estimate that uh, 5,000 Soviet troops left in uh, November immediately with the missiles with, and with the bombers. Then we estimate that in the last uh, month that uh, approximately 4,000 Soviets have left. If we accept the figure, which was always a rough calculation, that there were 21,000, 22,000 Soviets uh, there at the height of the crisis, we could get some idea of where approximately we think the figures are today. It's bound to be a, a generalized figure because it's, it's impossible to take a detailed head count. That still leaves uh, some thousands uh, on the island. We hope they're going to be withdrawn, and we will continue to observe very closely in the next uh, days, immediate weeks ahead, whether there's going to be further withdrawals, which, of course, uh, we wish for. Mr. President, Mr. President <coughs> again, uh, two weeks ago, you indicated that the situation in Korea had not yet hardened to a point where any talk uh, by you would be helpful. Uh, there does appear to have been a hardening situation uh, in the meantime. Would you say how you feel now about the continuation of military rule in Korea? As you know, the conversations have been going on between the military group and uh, the civilian opposition. It is our hope that a situation will develop which will permit the blossoming of uh, democratic uh, rule and responsible and stable democratic rule in South Korea. These conversations have not finished. If the United States government feels that this is a finally, in the final sense, a decision for the people of South Korea. We've indicated uh, what our hopes are, but this is a judgment which the people of South Korea must make and the responsible officials in South Korea. In any case, it is our hope that they, an accord will be reached between the military group, its chairman, and the civilians so that uh, we will see in the future a emerging pattern of democratic rule. But as of today, the situation is not uh, clear. Yes, Mr. Lawrence? Would you be willing to discuss with us, sir, the political and military difficulties of preventing uh, these hit-and-run raids by Cuban exiles who believe they are striking a blow for freedom? Well, the, uh, obviously, uh, Florida, it's long coast, and it's possible that uh, for some people uh, to go from uh, Florida and uh, strike at a target and come back. Uh, we have attempted to discourage it for a number of reasons. We believe it's ineffective. There was a raid conducted on, uh, in Cuba, left around uh, the 17th, I think, uh, the evening of the 17th and 18th, that uh, shot at a Soviet uh, 
merchant ship as a target of opportunity. It returned. A number of the people who took part in it came to Washington, held a press conference. Doesn't seem to us that this uh, represents any real blow at Castro. It gives additional incentives for the Soviet Union to maintain their personnel in Cuba, to send additional units to protect their merchant ships. It uh, is not uh, controlled. No one uh, in a position of responsibility uh, knows about it. So that uh, it will bring reprisals, possibly on American ships. We will then be expected to take a military action to protect our ships, which may bring a counteraction. I think that when these issues of war and peace uh, hang uh, uh, in the balance, that uh, the United States government and authorities uh, should, uh, and when American territory is being used, uh, should have uh, a position of some control on the matter. So we don't think that they're effective. We don't think they weaken Castro. We don't uh, think that uh, a rather hastily organized uh, raid, uh, which uh, maybe shoots up a merchant ship or kills some crewman, comes back, holds a press conference. It doesn't seem to us that that represents a serious blow to Castro and, in fact, may assist him in maintaining his control. Now, I want to contrast that kind of action with action of some other Cubans who are and I don't criticize these uh, men who took part in this. They're anxious to see their island free, but uh, we just don't feel that this uh, advances their cause. I contrast that with some others. For example, uh, between four and 500 members of the brigade who were prisoners who were at the Bay of Pigs have joined the United States Army. 200 as officers, 250 as men who are now in training and who I think will be uh, very fine uh, soldiers and can uh, serve uh, the common cause. The head of the commander of the brigade, Oliver, Oliver who is a Cuban, a Negro, uh, got uh, all of his marks 100 in joining the service. So I think there's a good many very determined, persistent Cubans who are determined that their island should be free, and we wish to assist them. We distinguish between those actions which we feel advances the cause of freedom and these hit-and-run raids which we do not feel advance the cause of freedom, and we're attempting to discourage those. Two weeks ago, six Republican members of the Joint Economic Committee, House and Senate, wrote you a long letter of suggestions about federal expenditures, including a request that you establish a presidential commission on federal expenditures, somewhat similar to the Clay Commission on Foreign Aid. What would be your position on that suggestion? Well, I think we have the Bureau of the Budget, which uh, oversees the and gathers together all of the recommendations which we wish to make for programs. We then submit it to the Congress, the House and Senate. They, oh, they finally appropriate the money. We do not. So that the House and Senate has its opportunities with its staff. The Appropriations Committee, we have probably the most effective staff in Washington for the amount of work they do and the men employed in the Bureau of the Budget. I'm very satisfied with this procedure. Mr. President, uh, is it valid, sir, for the government to give a defense contract to a firm in order to keep that firm as part of the production arsenal of this country? And two, did that happen in the case of the TFX award to General Dynamics? No, uh, to the last part, in the, se in the first case, if it's a hypothetical case, I would say it would depend on the circumstance, how great the need is. Is it for a particular kind of tools which we might need in the case of emergency? I can think of cases where it would be valid. It has nothing to do with the TFX. Uh, even though this is a new Congress, uh, hasn't it in its three months of life made a very low record of accomplishments, and what do you think is the trouble? Well, I must say uh, that I'm familiar with these stories in March and April that the Congress isn't doing anything. And I think this Congress is going to uh, act on the major pieces of legislation. The House Ways and Means Committee is now considering the tax bill. The House Rules Committee reported out the bill for aid for medical construction and education today in the House. The Senate this afternoon is considering the transit bill. It will be considering in the next few days the Youth Employment Opportunities Bill. So I would say that you will see in April and May and June a good many important pieces of legislation come to the floor. But I think that this is a, if I may use that word again, a rhythm of January and February, and then March, the stories start to be written about the Congress not doing anything in April, and then in May, we begin to get some bills to the floor, and some are defeated, and then there are those stories about uh, presidential leadership. <laughs> so, <laughs> is, there a lesson, is there a lesson in the recent New York newspaper strike that might lead to the settling of labor disputes in this particular industry 
by means other than strikes in the future? No, I don't see it. I think that unless the unions and the employers are ready to accept compulsory arbitration, there's no indication that either would be. I don't see that we're going to be able to set up any mechanical operation which uh, would uh, stop a city strike. Now, a state may want to set up emergency procedures, uh, which the federal government has in cases affecting the national health and safety. That's a state judgment. But I don't see any federal actions that can be taken. I do feel, looking at that strike, that that strike could have been settled uh, many days before it was and conditions quite similar to what was finally accepted. But uh, neither side uh, uh, were prepared to take those actions which would have brought it to an end. But I don't see any mechanical changes we can make in laws which would affect the situation. Right. Yes. Israel has been evidencing growing concern over the manufacture of missiles in Egypt and unofficially has asked the United States to use its good offices with Bonn to discourage the use of German scientists in this endeavor. Can you tell us anything about that point? And secondly, can you tell us anything about Israel's uh, request for more armaments from this country? Well, as you know, the German government itself has indicated its uh, displeasure, and there's some question of whether it may be a breach of the law. The uh, German uh, scientists who uh, are working on missiles, air engines, and airframes uh, for the UAR. There are not a great number of them, but they are some of them. And, uh, of course, they do affect the uh, tensions in the Middle East. So I think this matter has been very uh, strongly brought to the attention by the Israeli government uh, and by other interested parties who are seeking to diminish rather than increase the arms race in the Middle East. Now, on the question of uh, what military assistance we would give the Israelis, as you know, the United States has never been a supplier of military equipment directly to the Israelis. We have given economic assistance. The Israelis themselves have bought equipment, uh, a good much deal of it from France. We would just have to see what the balance of military power may be in the Middle East as time goes on. We are anxious to see it diminished rather than participate in encouraging it. On the other hand, we would be reluctant to see a military balance of power in the Middle East which was such as to encourage aggression rather than discourage it. So this is a matter which we will have to continue to observe. We have uh, expressed our strong opposition to the introduction of, or manufacture of nuclear weapons in the Middle East and uh, have uh, indicated that uh, strongly to all of the countries. So uh, we have to wait and see uh, as the time goes on. At the present time, there is a balance which I think would discourage military action on either side. I would hope it will continue. Mr. President, General Eisenhower has taken a crack at the national budget. Uh, he told Charlie Halleck in a letter that uh, he thought it could be reduced by about $13 billion. The general was especially critical of your space program. He said that there were enormous sums being wasted in that field. Would you care to comment? Well, I think that uh, President Eisenhower referred us to uh, Morris Stams, his budget director, for guidance. And uh, I've examined uh, that record. Morris, under Morris Stams, this country had the largest peacetime deficit in history, took a $500 million surplus and put it into a $12.5 billion deficit, had the largest outflow of gold and dollars in our history, 1959, about $3.9 billion. We had two recessions, 1958 and 1960, and we had the highest peacetime unemployment, 1959, since World War II. That's not a record that we plan to duplicate if we can help it. Now, secondly, uh, secondly, uh, the United States uh, Congress almost unanimously made a decision that the United States would not continue to be second in space. We are second in space today because we started late. It requires a large sum of money. I don't think uh, we should look with equanimity upon the prospect that we will be second all through the 60s and possibly the 70s, as we have the potential not to be. I think that uh, having made the decision last year that we should make a major effort to be first in space, I think we should continue to do so. Now, President Eisenhower, has, this is not a new position for him. He has disagreed uh, with this, I know, at least a year and a year and a half ago when the Congress took a different position. So he's not, uh, it's a position I think he took uh, uh, from uh, the time of Sputnik on, but it's a matter on which we disagree. So I think we may be that there's waste in the, in the uh, space budget. If there's waste, then I think it ought to be cut out by the Congress, and I'm sure it will be. But if we're getting to the question of whether we should be, uh, reconcile ourselves to a slow pace in space, I don't think so. This administration has concentrated its attention since it came into office in strengthening our military. That's one of the reasons why you could not possibly put in the cut 
which has been recommended, nine or $10 billion, without cutting the hot out of the military budget. The fact of the matter is, when we came into office, we had 11 combat-ready divisions. We now have 16. We inc increased the scheduling on Polaris nearly double per year. We've increased the number of planes on the 15-minute alert from 33% of our strategic air force to 50%, and in a whole variety of ways. In the Navy, we've added about 46 vessels. We've strengthened ourselves. Defense and space. The fact of the matter is, in the non-defense, non-space expenditures, we've put in less of an increase in our three years than President Eisenhower did in his last three years. I'm concerned that we may not be putting in enough, rather than we're putting in too much, because the population of this country is growing. Four million people a year. So that I think that uh, uh, we ought to go ahead with what we're talking about. We ought to uh, uh, have effective, tight budget control, which we've tried to have. The Congress may be able to improve on it. But this idea that you can cut that budget wholesale without cutting very essential national programs, and number two, taking $9 billion out of the economy, is just bound, in my opinion, to put you into an economic uh, uh, decline instead of a rise. So I think we ought to uh, recognize that the percentage of our budget expenditures as a percentage of our gross national product are about the same as they were all through the 50s. The budget may have gone up because the country's growing and the population's growing, but so is our gross national product. And the debt as a percentage of our gross national product steadily declining. So I think we're in good position, providing we can prevent an economic decline of the kind we had very rapidly, 58 and then 60. And I think we can do that if we have effective programs of the dimensions that we're talking about plus the tax cut. Because we have to have, I'll just, <laughs> we have to have, just to keep the number of, to absorb the people coming in the labor market, we have to have a $25 billion increase in our gross national product just to absorb the people coming into the labor market, let alone cut down the number who are now unemployed. So that's my view of that matter. Thank you. President, <laughs> as you know, we've had uh, difficulties lately in both uh, Guatemala and Argentina, two countries which, uh, under the Alliance for Progress, were making efforts to get on their feet economically and uh, uh, politically. I wonder how you feel about these uh, developments. Do you regard these as symptomatic of the problem the Alliance is trying to attack uh, what are your, how do, what yes, are your I think so. That's right, I do. I do regard it as symptomatic. There is instability. Part of it through the hemisphere comes from maldistribution of wealth. Part of it comes from inadequate wealth. Part of it comes from the fact that they've been in a depressed state really since 57 or 58 because of a drop in commodity prices. Part of it comes from illiteracy. And if very hard to maintain a democratic form of government as we've seen even in, in uh, Western Europe, which has all many advantages. So that uh, to do it in Latin America with so many disadvantages is extremely complicated. Great progress has been made, and a good many democratic governments now exist. I saw one of the finest in Costa Rica the other day. But uh, I certainly would agree with you that what's happening in Guatemala, what's happening in the Argentine, is symptomatic of the challenges which face us in this hemisphere and which the alliance is trying to meet. President, uh, Venezuela has said that it does not intend to recognize the new government in Guatemala because it took power by force. This is a recurring problem in various places. Are we going to have any consistent or uniform policy on whether or not to recognize governments that take power by force? No, we haven't got a consistent uh, policy because the, situ the circumstances are sometimes inconsistent. What we are interested in now is what assurances we get as to when a democratic government uh, or when elections will be held. This government, which has taken over in Guatemala, has indicated that it will uh, provide a return to democratic uh, rule. When we have a clear idea of that, and also what the position will be of the other Central American countries who are so intimately associated in the common market in other ways, we'll then be able to make a judgment as to whether it's in our interest to uh, proceed ahead. Mr. Riggs. Mr. Riggs. We have a brand new issue in Kentucky in the Democratic primary. The question is how much time Governor Chandler spent with you on Monday. Mr. Salinger, which O'Donnell says, you popped out and shook his hand. Mr. Chandler got back home to Kentucky and said he spent more than half an hour with you. And he says, Mr. Salinger has quit managing the news. He's now not telling the truth. <laughs> Could you tell us how much time you saw Mr. Chandler? <laughs> well, I've never attempted to... Uh, Governor Chandler uh, called up and talked to, uh, I think, Mr. O'Donnell on Monday morning said he was in town, was there with his wife, his two sons, and his granddaughter. I'd like to pay a friendly call. I was glad to see a former governor, senator, and uh, one who 
I've known for a good many years. So I was delighted to have him by, and I wouldn't possibly uh, clock him. <laughs> on, your, uh, on your trip to Europe, there have been a lot of rumors about uh, other cities than Rome and Bonn and Berlin wanting you to visit them. And I wonder if there's anything you could tell us now about what other cities you might visit, possibly uh, London or even Paris, and, and also if you could tell us when you might be going. No, we have no plans to visit uh, London or Paris, and uh, uh, we will be going, I would think, uh, the last half of June. Rome and Bonn, that's our, and Berlin, that's our present uh, schedule. President, yeah. President, we're told that the principal reason that you have asked Congress to increase the size of the Peace Corps to 13,000 is because of the new emphasis on Latin America. But isn't there some danger that these countries will be disappointed if that goal isn't reached? Yes, we're going to attempt to uh, make a major effort in Latin America. I would hope that in the, in the uh, Peace Corps, I would hope that uh, this month where we must really get our applications for... Uh, the summer when most of the students will be available, I would hope we would, they would put their applications in in April. We need uh, nurses, teachers, uh, those who are knowledgeable in the mechanical arts, liberal arts school graduates. I would hope that uh, we would get a good, uh, strong uh, volunteer group in April, and we will concentrate on Latin America, and I think based on our experience already with them, it will be most useful. Mr. Yeah, President, tomorrow we'll start hearings uh, in the Senate on the new uh, Foreign Service Academy. Why is this necessary? Why wouldn't it be better to have returning officers uh, uh, go to the schools at Pennsylvania or Harvard or Chicago and uh, see something of the country to which they are returning uh, while they're doing their studies? Well, I think you might say, why don't we eliminate the National War College? I think that the problems which they face are very specialized, particularly uh, those ambassadors or ministers or Foreign Service officers who go to... Latin America, Africa, and Asia, the Middle East, where you've got uh, a good many paramilitary, uh, economic, social, political problems, all the rest. And I think that uh, we need, and the Foreign Service Institute has indicated a response to that need, but we need a much stronger service in the same way we need the National War, Co uh, War College. Now, that doesn't mean that some students may continue to go to, may not continue to go to the places you name, but I think we need one here in Washington, which is directly uh, tied to the work of the State Department particularly the work in the areas which I've described, where an ambassador, I just looked, I saw Mr. Ambassador Gullion this morning from the Congo. When you think of the decisions, for example, which our ambassador in Guatemala must now make, our ambassador in South Korea must have made over the last three weeks, and we depend heavily, of course, on the judgment of the people there, the judgment that our ambassador in Laos has had to make over the last uh, year, the judgment of our ambassadors in Pakistan and India, these are the most important, significant, the judgment of our ambassador in Yemen and Saudi Arabia. I think we need this school because I think these men deal with questions which are so intimately related to the work of the department itself that I think that the institute ought to be here, close to the department, and working with it. Yes. President, sir, do you plan to take any action to head off a threatened railroad strike? Yes, we will, and by this afternoon we're going to announce the appointment of a board. President, what is your evaluation of Khrushchev's present status and the nature of the political struggle that's apparently now going on in the Kremlin? And is the uncertainty in the Kremlin affecting U.S. policy decisions right now, for instance, over Cuba? No, but I would think it's possible that uh, Khrushchev is subjected to the same, uh, though I don't think we know precisely, but I would suppose that he has his good months and his bad months, like we all do. <laughs> When, by when do you think we will be uh, for, yes, well, we will be first in space and in view of Russia's current uh, lunar probe, do you think we'll beat Russia with a man to the moon? I don't know. We started well behind. Quite obviously, they had a tremendous advantage in big boosters. We're still behind because obviously we haven't gotten our new boosters yet, which we won't get till 64, 5, and 6, so that uh, we just have to wait and see. But I can assure you that it's an uphill race at best, because we started behind, I sh I'm sure the Russians are making a major effort. Today's indication of what they are doing makes me feel that their program is a major one and is not uh, spongy, and I think that uh, we would have to uh, make the same ourselves. So I would say we're behind now, we'll continue to be behind, but if we make a major effort, we have a chance, I believe, to be ahead at the end of this decade, and that's where I think we ought to be. Yes, if, uh, <coughs> will we be able to maintain our special relation with the United Kingdom if uh, Mr. Harold Wilson uh, and the Labour Party win the next British I election? don't see any reason why our relationship uh, uh, should change uh, with Great Britain. It's existed with Labour governments and Conservative governments. If 
I think it's a relationship uh, based on uh, uh, history and uh, common interest, and we also have uh, strong uh, relations with the other countries of Western Europe. We have special relations in Latin America. I think that uh, Mr. Wilson said, and I think Harold Prime Minister McMillan has said, that the word special is perhaps not the most appropriate word to describe it. It's a very strong, intimate, and a reassuring relationship, and I think will exist regardless of who's in power. Sir, I wonder if you think there should be a double standard for congressmen and one for men in the executive branch of government. I'm referring to these articles on cheating congressmen, which Jack Anderson wrote about the other day. And I wonder if you think, since you've been in Congress in the executive branch, if uh, there should be the same standard for no conflict of interest and honesty as Congress insists upon for the executive, if you think this should be the same thing for congressmen. Well, I think this is a matter which the Congress is... Uh, is the, most, uh, is the best judge of their own standards. As a matter of fact, I think the Constitution so states, uh, and I would think that uh, uh, they would be jealous of their reputation as uh, really any man or woman should be. Uh, you said a moment ago that uh, your administration had no intention of emulating the uh, record of the Eisenhower administration in a number of economic respects, and you've often stated your uh, uh, desires to move the country ahead in a number of... Uh, number of social fields, education, for instance. And yet you say that uh, in your uh, first three budgets, your uh, non-space, non-defense expenditures are less than in the last three Eisenhower budgets. My question is this. Uh, d does this uh, balance of resources, this commitment of resources disturb you? Yes, Did I think that uh, I would like to see the United States able to do more in some areas, even though the programs we've suggested in uh, education, if it's accepted by the Congress, would be very important, not only this year, which, but also in the other years. It's a major program. So I think that we've uh, got a uh, solid basis for action. But I do think it is. On the other hand, I think that uh, uh, the, sp uh, the defense program is, uh, in my opinion, essential, and I think the space program is vital. But uh, what we're now talking about are those who wish to cut this program, the civilian and the non-defense uh, expenditures, by such a substantial figure. For example, those who say that we should cut our foreign assistance by a billion and a half, uh, even though this assistance is vital to the maintenance of a good many countries' independence, at the same time, as I've said before on other occasions, uh, these speeches, anti-communist speeches are made. They want to prevent any communists taking over in Latin America. They want to deny Latin America any economic assistance, and they want us to do something about Cuba because it's communist. I don't understand that logic. I think that uh, the budget we've set up, set up is... Uh, is soundly based. I do think there is always a question of whether we are expending enough for civilian needs. But I do, uh, but it still is a large budget, it's an a large deficit, and I think that we've done about as much as we now can do. In other years, we may have to do more because this year we held our non defense expenditures to the same figure as last year. Uh, yesterday, according to reports, comedian Dick Gregory was manhandled by police in Greenwood, Mississippi. Do you have any comment on the voter registration drive in Greenwood? Or particularly, do you think the Justice Department can do more in terms of speed and effectiveness to enhance the effort down there? Now, well, we've had a suit there since last August against the registrar on the ground of discrimination. The voting we have now, a suit which we launched the other day against the denial of uh, the rights of the voters themselves. And uh, that's due for a hearing uh, very shortly, not maybe, perhaps this week. Uh, and then I would hope that the uh, court would find uh, that uh, there has been a denial of rights, which seems to me evident, but which the court must decide. Now, uh, if we had been, if we secure the passage of the voting bill, which we sent up to the Congress this week, in the case of the voter registrar case, a registrar would be permitted to sit during the period that the case was being considered, because what we now have is a registrar who is charged with discrimination in denying certain citizens the right to vote, and he's been sitting since last August when our suit was filed, and the suit, because of the law's delay, has not yet uh, been settled. So uh, that is an area where there's a vacuum uh, in the law, and I would hope we could fill it. But on the subject itself, we have two federal suits, and uh, both of them are very important, and both of them, uh, I hope, uh, will result in actions which will uh, uh, bring uh, justice in uh, Greenwood, Mississippi. Thank you.